Almost every gasoline car has an alternator. It is an item in a car that have got, gone such a long transformation over time to where we are today. And in today's video, I wanna first explain to you what an alternator does, but more importantly, how do you prolong the life of your alternator and kind of what's going on with modern alternators and what actually changed Folks are used to how alternators used to be, but things changed drastically with alternators over the years. So in this video, we're gonna explain that and more right after this. Folks, we have to start with the basics. How do alternators work? How are we gonna preserve them and take care of them and understand them if we don't know how they work? The alternator is basically a generator. That's what generates electricity so you can maintain your battery and then power up all the electronics of the car. So the alternator uses a very basic principle. If you create a magnetic field that is rotating on off on off against coils it's going to actually generate electricity. That's just a very basic gist of it. It's a lot more complicated than that. So here's how this is going to go. Your alternator is always being spun by the belt of the engine. You have a pulley belt spins it and that spins the inside. What it's actually spinning is something called the rotor. It's basically a small coil with metal plates on it that's going to create kind of a magnet. When you spin this magnet against three phases of wire windings. These are called the stator. That component is called the stator. That is the outside that is stationary. When you spin this magnet, you're going to actually generate electricity. But it's a little bit more complicated than that because if you do this method, you're actually going to create AC voltage, alternating current, same type of current you find in your house that does not have a constant positive and negative. It's always switching back and forth. That's why it's called alternating current. But cars run on DC, which is direct current. You have a positive and a negative. It's never changing. It's always positive and negative. So here is the kind of the, a little bit of a science behind it and how the various components work of an alternator. But in order to explain that very clearly to you, we're gonna go to the whiteboard and do some nerdy stuff with drawings. Here's how an alternator works in basic terms. Very basic, we're gonna keep things extremely basic. You have three phases on the stator. So you have one kind of wound up wire and then one side comes up and the other side comes up. And then you have another wound up wire and one side comes up, one side comes up. And then the other coil right here, one side comes out, one side comes out. Hope you are seeing this. This is not turning at all. Now in the middle of this, you will have the rotor. This turns with the engine. This has kind of metal plates on it that are opposite direction. When you apply power to this, to the windings inside of this, there is a winding here. You apply power to that, you have, you create a magnetic field that's gonna jump to these wires and you're gonna have power generated in AC, in alternating current. And here's how this is actually gonna go. One side of this will come out, one side of this will come here, and then this one will come here. You have these three. These other three, they are connected together, and that's your ground. Very simple. This side, however, this is alternating current, and this is how the alternator is gonna take that and convert it to DC. See, if we look at, this is kind of the waveform of alternating current. This is zero volts. If you look at it, it's gonna be positive, negative, positive, negative. That's how that's gonna look like. So each one of these wires is gonna be putting out a signal like this. And because they are phased at different areas, you're gonna have three signals that look like this. Here's the second one. And then you have a third one. Okay. 
that looks like this. So how do we convert this into DC power? Aha, this is where the magic is. Let me erase these and I'll draw them together as one signal. This is our zero volt. The first signal will go like this. The second signal is kind of going to overlap that a little bit. And then the third signal is going to also overlap that a little bit. I hope this is very clear to see. You see how they're overlapping, but we still have that negative part that we don't want. A DC current is just one straight line. So in line connected to these will be a diode. A diode is basically a one-way valve, if you would. That's the best way to explain it. It will allow voltage to go one way, but not the other way. So it's going to cut out the ground of each one of these signals. Every time the voltage dips, it's going to stop the current flow until it comes back up, then it's going to let it go. So here's what it's basically the diodes are going to do. They're going to take this signal and they're going to do this to it. We only have the peaks. This little ripple, that's actually constant power. And there is your DC voltage. Now this little ripple that you see like kind of dips, they're gonna put it through a capacitor that's gonna kind of charge up and even it out. And it ends up being DC positive. That is how this, this is like magic, how this works. I love it. As simple as this theory is, electrical world, things have gotten way more advanced. This is a very basic operation, and it still does work like that today. But then there is the most important part. Well, right now, this is 12 volts right here. When I'm spinning this at idle speed, what about when, when you speed up, rev up the engine, this is going to generate more and all of a sudden this voltage will be 27 volts. Well, now what? They need to control the voltage. And the way they do that is something called a regulator. And that regulator actually sits controlling this guy, which is the coil that actually starts the magnetic field. You have a regulator. This regulator, what it does is it lowers and raises the voltage to this guy. So when you have less voltage or controlled voltage that is going here, as you speed this, as this speeds up with the engine RPM, we're going to lower the voltage to keep it from shooting up to 27 volts. Very, very cool. That is as simple as that is. And things are a lot more complicated than this. There's a lot of little stuff that keep things going. But that is the basic operating principle. Pretty cool, right? So here is really quick, one of the common, I want to say older problems of alternators. Newer alternators gotten really good about this. When you have a bad diode, one of these three diodes that make this happen go bad. Here's what's going to happen. This is how your signal will, will look like. When this happens to DC circuits, basically there is havoc. The level of electrical gremlins you will have when you have this little guy over here, it'll throw computers off because they don't understand. Now, wait a second, I have voltage, then I have ground, and then I have voltage, and it's just DC computers and DC components when you do this to them. Sometimes you'll fry them right away. Sometimes they'll just behave in a, in a matter that is unexplainable. This will cause all kinds of problems. And it's all because of a simple little diode that decided to short out and now it's sending power both ways. And we have all kinds of problems. Folks, one last thing. On the diode part, sometimes they are called the rectifier. That whole deal where it, it smooths out the ripple and takes care of this. They call it a rectifier. It's just 
in case you run into that term. Now that we understand how the basic operation of an alternator works, let us talk about how things actually changed over time. With a slight bias toward Toyota and Lexus, because that's what I specialize in, and most of it applies to other manufacturers, but some of them do it a little bit differently. As far as, far as I remember, Toyotas had the regulators the regulator that regulates the voltage inside their alternator. Some alternators actually from other manufacturers have it elsewhere. But what changed over time is the regulator used to be a very basic self-sustaining device. It just watches the voltage and it kind of adjusts accordingly and it does its own thing. But what happened over time, we have computers in cars. And initially the computers were so stone age, they couldn't, they could barely do what they were supposed to do. They couldn't do anything else. But now computers got very high end in cars and things became very streamlined where computers can control things that you never thought they would be able to control. One of those is the alternator. See, computers are so quick at detecting what's happening. Okay, the AC is coming on, the power steering motor is running, we're demanding this, we're turning on the lights, we're gonna do this, the radios at this point, they all communicate and talk on the network. They deem that if we control that alternator via the engine computer, things will be a lot faster. And this regulator will be like razor sharp, how it changes things. So they started actually controlling the regulator using the engine computer is going to send a signal to it increase or decrease that magnetic field so we can generate more or less and here's the other thing that came into play and kind of sprinkled all over this alternators draw a lot of mechanical load on the engine it just it's something dragging the engine down and anything that drags the engine down equals worse gas mileage higher emissions because remember, the race to lower the emissions, get you that good gas mileage, is on. So the alternator went on that as well. The computer will almost, in some cases, when you're sitting at idle, low load, the lights are off, the radio's off, you don't really have much going on. They will almost stop charging the battery. I mean, it's that low. If it sees that the battery is in good health, it's going to almost stop doing anything. That's how things have gotten. Because they figured, while well, you're stopped at a traffic light, you're gonna have that takeoff. Every time you take off your car, it's maximum load, on, because it's just simple physics. Making an object that's stationary into a moving object takes a lot of effort. So they figured that's the time where things will be at their peak. So the alternator almost stops charging when you take, when you take off every single time in modern cars. But there's something else that they did that also puts kind of a load, a mechanical load on the engine. See, you rev your engine up, and modern engines rev up, rev down very rapidly. Let's think of this. If that rotor is connected mechanically to the pulley, well, every time you accelerate, it's gonna start spinning fast, and then when you let go of the gas, that engine drop, it's actually the alternator will hold it back from dropping the RPM. And it's going to create a very abnormal motion. So here's what they did. They added a one-way clutch, usually inside the pulley. So when the engine needs to rev down, but the alternator is still spinning, so we wouldn't have that loss of generation and then a jerking motion to the engine, that actually lets the inside of the alternator continue to spin at a different speed until it naturally winds down while the engine already came down to idle. That made a huge difference in how well alternators work. However, if you put heavy load on these alternators, in those cases, this wouldn't work very well. So alternators stopped being battery chargers. They were never intended to be, folks. Most folks will make these mistakes. Most people assume that the alternator is a very, very heavy duty battery charger. It is actually not, believe it or not, that is not the case anymore. Alternators are meant to maintain a healthy battery. They're not meant to charge a dead one. And that is where the biggest things you should never do, the number one destroyer of alternators, the battery. See, 
The system was designed for you to use the battery to start the car, which is the starter of the car is always the highest electrical load on the electrical system of any car. No matter how many gizmos it has, the starter remains the highest electrical load. So after you start the car, you depleted a little bit of the charge of that battery. The alternator is meant to charge it up to that little point. I mean, think about it. You did not completely deplete your battery when you started your car once. Otherwise, every time you start it, if you try to start it, shut it off, start it, shut it, it'll just die. And that's not the case. So when you start your engine, you used a little bit of the charge of that battery. The alternator is meant to maintain it up and then keep the electrical systems going, which do not consume, all the electrical systems combined do not consume nowhere near as much as a starter does. That's why the battery takes care of the starter. So when you have a dead battery and the battery died, you know, you left the light on, but it's a healthy battery, it's actually not a good idea to just jump the car and just let's go, let's keep driving because you are going to overload this alternator. Something you did not know about modern cars, when you have a dead battery or a weak battery, your gas mileage will come down. You get worse gas mileage. People always wonder like, what does that have to do with that? It actually does because your alternator is meant to barely be working in certain areas. It's gonna be working full force to charge this dead battery. Sometimes full fielding that alternator where this is the maximum allowed amperage that it can give just to charge that dead battery while you're driving, not really thinking about it. And that continuous will kill that alternator early because you're just, you're running it at its max power all the time. But what's worse than that is something that I see people do over and over and over. That is the guaranteed way to kill that alternator. Have a dead, completely dead battery where it's like, you jump it, it starts, and then you shut it off. Even after a long drive, it won't even light up anything. That is the number one just destroyer of alternators immediately. Because the alternator is trying to charge a battery that is not taking a charge. That's where technology have not gotten there where it can detect that and stop charging it. They can't do that, they're connected all the time. Folks, the battery is the number one thing that usually kills alternators. And please don't make the mistake of thinking that the alternator is meant to charge a completely dead battery, a depleted battery, or worse, kind of revive a battery that is completely bad cells and everything. That is your number one cause for alternator failures. The other causes and the other things that you should not do to your alternator that most people actually don't think about. See, alternators generate heat and that's just the way they are. You have something spinning, generating, it's gonna make heat. And for that reason, they need to be cooled. Some 90% of cars, the alternator is air-cooled, just has openings outside, as it spins, it's kind of cycling air in and out. Some of them will even have an actual fan at the end of them. Very few of them are gonna be cool and cooled. If you go into the, some of the German cars, they are cool and cooled and they're completely sealed off. But majority of cars, they are cooled. So those fins, they're open to the elements, they're open to you washing your engine bay, but more importantly than that, more realistic scenario, they're open to oil leaks, coolant leaks, all kinds of stuff leaking on them. Depends where your alternator location is. If it happens to be down or towards the back of the engine, you gotta be watching, watchful of leaks on top of it because any leaks will go right inside of it and we have major issues. The best location for an alternator, and this is something, you know, as we do reviews, if you haven't checked the second channel, check it out. When we do car reviews, I actually look at this stuff. If the alternator is a good spot, which the ideal spot for an alternator is very high towards the front, not covered up, open, where you don't have sources of leaks right onto it. You don't have easy access of water to it, which is right between the radiator and the engine. That's usually the dry area of engines. You gotta watch for when you wash the engine bay, you wanna cover that. But more importantly, if you have oil leaking on them and coolant, you gotta make sure you fix those leaks, not let them continue to leak onto this alternator and eventually just destroy it. Let's talk about a few things, kind of the odds and ends of alternators, things that you will not know about unless been there, done that type situation. First thing is, how do you clean an alternator that got wet? with water, with oil, with whatever the case may be. Folks, do not make the mistake of cleaning them with water. Of course, that is the number one thing. The second thing is don't use brake clean. 
That's a common mistake I see. See, brake clean is used to clean oil and leaks and whatnot, but don't use it on an alternator directly because it actually causes a lot of issues with alternators. Instead, use electronic cleaners. They are meant to go on electronics. There's a lot of electronics inside this alternator. They're meant to clean it and they do a very good job. Ideally though, I will say this, you cannot really clean an alternator very well unless you take it apart. So ideally, don't get it oil on it to begin with. When you start seeing that oil leak getting a little out of hand, fix the oil leak. Don't let it destroy the alternator. The other thing is, what are the signs of failures for alternators? And this is, people always look at this. In the olden days, you start seeing the lights dim and things kind of flicker and whatnot. But in the modern days, you won't see this stuff. But there's one symptom remaining, which is very important that you know about it whining. It's a very distinct whining noise out of the alternator. And the best easiest way to diagnose that as if you are DIYing this or whatnot, there's usually two plugs on alternators. One of them is a big wire that's bolted down. There's the voltage wire. The other one is a little connector. If you unplug that connector, the alternator stops doing everything. And so is the whining noise it will immediately disappear. You hear that loud whining noise that goes up and down with the engine speed. That is your first sign. That alternator is complaining and it's time to replace it because pretty soon it's going to strand you. Speaking of stranding you, many people don't realize this. More, all modern cars have this feature. It's built into the circuit of the alternator. When the alternator stops charging, the battery light will come on the dash. Most people assume that light means, oh, the battery is weak, time to replace it. No, it's a little mis kind of confusing that sign but when you see a battery light on the dash the alternator is not charging at all it's not doing anything it's not maintaining the battery right now you are running off the battery 100 percent that's what that means so if we see that that is code red let's put it this way you see that park the car don't drive it until you are ready to fix it because you keep driving it, you're going to deplete that battery, deplete it, deplete it until basically the whole electrical system shuts down and it becomes a very large paperweight. Don't do that. You see that battery light? Stop driving. That is your alternator, folks. Don't get it wet. Don't have oil go on it. Do not drive it with a dead battery. That's the easiest way to prolong the life of your alternator. And folks, some people will say alternators are wear items and they are. That's the reality. Same thing with a starter. They all have a life. You're not expecting this to be something that lasts forever. Nothing lasts forever, but especially an alternator. It's a, it's a component that gets a lot of wear and tear and a lot of load on this little component. Something about alternators that I will share with you last as we close this video. The most important advice from a mechanic. Don't buy aftermarket alternators. That is the biggest mistake I see. If you, for example, if you drive a Toyota or Lexus, you buy a Denso alternator, that is the only approved alternator. Everything else, not a good idea because the alternator can cause so many other issues. Like we talked about how the AC voltage, if one of these diodes is not made well and all of a sudden shorts out and starts sending AC, it's gonna cause all kinds of electrical gremlins that you do not wanna be dealing with. When it comes to alternators, you're likely going to replace one alternator in the life of the car, maybe two, unless you're going very, very high miles and you're going to go through a lot. But an alternator and an equally a starter, you never buy an aftermarket one. That is just the truth. And the common thing with those is it takes you three, uh, three aftermarket alternators to find a good one. And then after a year or two, it's gone. Or worse, it starts causing all kinds of electrical gremlins. Stick with your OEM alternator, folks. This 100% applies to Toyota, Lexus, possibly others, but that is the last thing that you need to know about. Folks, I hope this video was helpful and informative. I hope you learned something new. If you like it, consider giving it a thumbs up. If you're not a subscriber, consider subscribing to the channel. Check out some other videos. And until the next video, folks, may the Lord bless you and keep you, and you have yourself a wonderful day.